All right, welcome to Irish Sauk County. We're going to talk about uh, some of the early Irish immigration to Sauk County. And while I'd love to mention every single Irish family that came to Sauk County, uh, time uh, does not allow. But uh, hopefully we'll get the gist of uh, when, the, when the Irish started coming here and some of the remarkable things that they did and some of the things that they experienced. We'll start off with a few pictures of the Emerald Isle. Uh, green during this uh, late winter season. This is Edenfor Hill in County Antrim in Northern Ireland. Here's another picture of Cranach in County Tyrone. And here's a third picture of the Emerald Isle. Actually, I'm pulling your leg on that one. This is actually our neck of the woods here in the Driftless region, and you can see how similar it looks to Ireland, at least parts of Ireland. Um, one thing you'll probably notice is how many more trees we have here uh, than in Ireland. In case you're wondering, uh, Ireland is about 32,595 square miles which makes it uh, half the size of Wisconsin. Uh, in addition to that, Sauk County is 831 square miles, and that makes it equal to either County Londonderry or County Kilkenny in Ireland. So just a little fun facts there for you as we start out. Now we're gonna tell the story tonight on and off as we talk about the Irish of a particular Irishman named Archibald Barker, who was born in 1816 in County Tyrone uh, to Thomas and Rebecca Barker. And when he was 18, and, uh, age 18 in 1834, he got on a ship and sailed for New York City. Uh, now in 1834, the trip would take about six weeks. Passengers were uh, had to bring their own food and they were at risk of that running out and being charged exorbitant prices for food on board. Uh, this was not a carnival cruise. Um, so passengers faced starvation, cholera, typhoid, fire, storms, and shipwreck. And water, which was supplied, was often stored in barrels that weren't cleaned after storing other things like oils and vinegar. So it was uh, not a pleasant trip to come across at that time, generally. But Barker landed in New York City um, in 1834. At that time, New York had a population of about 250,000. There was absolutely no Ellis Island, no Castle Garden, no immigration station. You simply got off the boat and walked into the city. Now, Irish immigration had occurred for centuries before Archibald Barker arrived, uh, long before that. In the 1600s, approximately 25,000 Irish Catholics left. Uh, some were forced to move, others left uh, voluntarily. And they came to the Caribbean and Virginia while from the 1680s uh, onward, Irish Quakers and Irish Protestants uh, began to come to the New World as well. Uh, during the uh, outbreak of the American Civil or Revolutionary War, uh, virtually uh, that virtually stopped immigration. And uh, following that, the Napoleonic Wars in Europe also prevented travel across uh, the Atlantic. So it really picked up again in the early 1800s from about 1815 to the start of the Great Irish Famine in 1846, uh, somewhere between 800,000 and 1 million Irish sailed for North America, with roughly half settling in Canada and the other half in the United States. And until the 1830s, Protestants actually outnumbered Catholics leaving Ireland. Uh, but then, of course, after that, in the 1830s, uh, Catholics greatly outnumbered the Protestants. The demise of the cottage spinning industry in the first half of the 19th century uh, due to the Industrial Revolution um, also led to massive displacement of workers, but many of these uh, did have industrial skills. So many of the early uh, immigrants in the first half of the 1800s um, from Ireland came to work on things like the Erie Canal and other uh, canal projects that started in their wake. Uh, they then found uh, work on railroads and others uh, worked in mines, and uh, they would eventually find their way here to the mines in southwestern Wisconsin. They also worked in other industries such as lumbering, smelting, and rail construction. Now, unlike some other immigrant groups, the Irish generally did not move immediately westward after arriving in the United States. Uh, Irish immigrants were more likely than any other group to move from county to county and from state to state in search of available land for farming. 
Uh, so the average Irish immigrant spent seven years in the United States before moving to Wisconsin. And that is uh, pretty much true for Mr. Archibald Barker. After uh, landing in New York, he possibly found work there. And then he also worked in New Jersey and Philadelphia. And by the summer of 1835, he was in uh, Iowa visiting a friend and helped him uh, do some farming. And then by about the summer of 1836, he was a part of the lead mining movement, southwestern Wisconsin. And we hear a lot about the Cornish miners uh, who came to that area, but the Irish were also well represented. And a place called Irish Diggings at New Dublin actually became what we know today as the city of Shellsburg. So they did leave their mark there. Uh, now, while Archibald Barker was in the lead mining region, he met a couple of other uh, lads from Ireland, Andrew Dunn and Hugh McFarland, uh, both his age. Uh, Dunn was born in uh, 1816 in the same county uh, and came to the U.S. when he was uh, 18, uh, coming more or less straight to the lead mining districts in Wisconsin. McFarland was born in uh, County Tyrone also in 1815, um, and he came over in 1834, about when Barker did, and eventually he married Andrew Dunn's sister. So these were the three amigos. And they also made another acquaintance that was quite favorable, and that was Henry Dodge Jr., who was the son of the future territorial governor, uh, Henry Dodge. And uh, so that gave Mr. Mr. Dodge Jr. a line on what was happening in Washington much quicker than uh, most other people. So Henry Dodge Jr. heard about the treaty uh, that the Ho-Chunk were coerced to sign in 1837 that opened up all this land that's uh, blank on the top of the Wisconsin map here uh, for settlement. Uh, for a period of years in the 1830s, the Wisconsin and Fox rivers were a dividing line between white settlement to the south and east and Native American lands to the north and west. But that changed in 1837 with the treaty with the Ho-Chunk and uh, subsequent treaties with other uh, tribes. And that, that whole story of their forced removal is a sad chapter in uh, Wisconsin history. Uh, but Barker and Dunn heard about the treaty even before the Ho-Chunk uh, back home did, and they immediately set off from uh, Mineral Point and uh, heard about the Baraboo Valley from uh, some Native Americans that they knew, and they crossed the Baraboo River, or I'm sorry, the Wisconsin River, south of what is today Sauk City, and then crossed the uh, Sauk Prairie uh, up to the bluffs. Uh, somehow they missed Devil's Lake. They went to the east of it, got over the bluffs, and ran into some swampy area, and they thought they had come back to the Wisconsin River. Um, however, on further inspection, they found out the river was flowing uh, the wrong way, and eventually they heard the sound of rapids, and that uh, brought them to the Baraboo Rapids uh, today in the city of Baraboo. And after crossing the river on a log jam, they um, followed an Indian path to the northeast, northwest side of town today near the upper Oxbow and finding an Indian uh, cornfield there that they thought was abandoned, um, they decided that they would uh, try and settle there. So they uh, slept for the night under the open sky and uh, near some trees. And the next morning, the, the two hardy miners set about the task of uh, building a cabin, having brought with them a few tools of the trade. Uh, so during the following day, Barker and Dunn were busily engaged at, at uh, raising the cabin, and they had the building up to about five or six feet when they were suddenly um, uh, came, uh, the, suddenly the Ho-Chunk appeared, and uh, they were quite uh, angry as well they should be. They had neither heard of the treaty yet, um, nor were they about to abide by it. It would be another three years before the forest removal started. So um, Andrew Dunn and Archibald Barker um, packed up their supplies and provisions, and the Ho-Chunk tore down the cabin, and that was um, the first uh, settlement attempt by Euro-Americans in Sauk County. So it took a few years before Archibald Barker came back. Uh, the first forest removal of the Ho-Chunk happened in 1840, and Barker came back and helped uh, Abe Wood and Wallace Rowan construct the first sawmill on the Baraboo River, which would be near that uh, upper Oxbow, if you know where Lower Oxner Park is today, it was in that vicinity. And um, they were successful in building a dam, an early sawmill, and then in the winter of 1840, 41, Barker uh, went into the pinery at Seeley Creek in 
the middle of Sauk County and uh, cut logs and ran them down the Baraboo River, the first ever to do so. And in 1841 in the summer, um, those were sawn up at uh, the Baraboo Mill of Wood and Rowan and Archibald Barker ran 10,000 feet of rough cut lumber in rafts down the Baraboo River. And if you've ever um, enjoyed the Baraboo River from Baraboo to uh, the Wisconsin, um, every time I look at it now, I can't help but think of Archibald Barker trying to get 10,000 feet of lumber on uh, in rafts um, down that river. There's so many twists and turns. But anyways, it was an easy way to make money. The trees were basically free. Um, they were cut up at a small uh, charge uh, to the miller, and uh, if you could get them down to a market, uh, it was uh, money waiting to be had. Barker continued to uh, log um, through the winters of 42, 43, and into 44, even though he lost all of the toes on his right foot to frostbite during one of those winters. And during uh, the later 40s, he started to acquire land in uh, Sauk County, but he wasn't about to settle down quite yet. And we'll come back to uh, his story a little later on. So while Barker was logging uh, in the 1840s in Sauk County, other Irish immigrants were arriving. One of the first was uh, Patrick Hickey, who came to Sauk County in 1846. Um, he was born in 1809, so he was a little older than um, Archibald Barker, but he was from County Mayo, and he came to America in 1837 with his brother, Michael Hickey, and again, they landed in New York just like uh, Archibald Barker about three years later. Uh, Patrick and Michael found work in New York, Maine and Chicago, again, following that, that pattern of kind of making their way west uh, during, uh, during, with various stops. Um, but they were farmers and in 1845, they set out from Chicago. They had heard of the Baraboo Valley and with a party of other land seekers, uh, they walked to the uh, Sauk County area to check it out. So they found their way to Northern Sauk County where they found a suitable piece of land in what is today the town of Delona. And they constructed a crude shanty there uh, where they stayed for two weeks. Uh, others in the party were not as enchanted. They went back, but uh, Patrick and Michael Hickey stayed and um, often wondered why they chose uh, this area of the county. There was probably flatter, more fertile property readily available at that time. Um, but one reason they came up this way uh, can be found in this 1845 federal survey map. And if we zoom in, you can see that there was a, 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 a Native American trail from the Wisconsin River to the Baraboo River. Um, that had been well-worn for centuries, and uh, this was certainly their path up to uh, the area that would become Delona, and the green star there indicates where Patrick Hickey uh, made his uh, claim and settlement. So it was um, uh, an easy place to get to. Uh, there was water nearby, as you can see on the map, and um, this is where they staked their claim. But they were certainly not the first people to inhabit this area, as, as we know any Euro-American settler uh, was not the first person here. Uh, nearby, literally just a few um, yards away, uh, were several Indian mounds. And you can see where Patrick Hickey's place is here with the yellow um, arrow. And just to the north were uh, mounds that were noted by William Canfield uh, some years later. There was, uh, we're not sure exactly how many, but probably a couple dozen uh, conical and effigy mounds in the area. And also nearby, just to the west of the mounds, was a circular um, enclosure or uh, Native American earthwork of a different type. It had embankments two feet high and roughly a circle. And then it also had pits outside of the embankment that were roughly still one foot uh, deep. And Canfield noted a pit resembling a fallen in well in the middle. So centuries, centuries old uh, things right in the neighborhood. Um, also not that far away, we all know about the Greenfield uh, Man Mound um, on the right side of this drawing, but just about 10 miles to the west was the Laval Man Mound um, which was uh, similar to the Greenfield Man Mound, except that it had the hands outstretched and the feet were pointed in the opposite direction. So just evidence again that uh, these were not the first people to settle this area and um, people had been here for uh, centuries and millennia. The Ho-Chunk uh, Indians 
Um, also, we're still in the area, um, having settlements along the Baraboo River and near the Dells, um, and certainly would have um, come across these early Euro-American settlers. Unfortunately, on June 14, 1850, just a few years after arriving, Michael Hickey died of an unknown cause. He was only 27, and he was the first settler to die in uh, this neck of the woods, and he was buried by his brother Patrick on a hill on the farm. Uh, meanwhile, about five years later, Patrick Hickey married Catherine Crowley, another uh, fine Irish person, and they went on to have six children, and eventually Patrick Hickey uh, developed a farm of some 320 acres. The Hickeys were um, followed very closely by the Horkins. They uh, settled there also in 1846. And uh, just like Patrick Hickey, Peter Horkin was uh, born in County Mayo, although he was several years younger. Unlike uh, Patrick uh, Hickey though, Peter Horkin was married when he came over. He had married uh, Bridget and uh, they came over together as a couple. Um, and like many, again, uh, Irish immigrants, they settled uh, elsewhere first. Uh, they first lived in Canada, where they kept a hotel in Toronto for a few years before moving to rural Ontario. Then from there, they went to a farm in Illinois and had um, a farm there for a while. And then in 1846, Peter Horkin, Patrick Mulligan, and William Reckliff all walked from their Illinois community to Sauk County, again, hearing about the area and uh, pursued investigating uh, land here. And the Horkins settled uh, in what would become Delona Township as well. And after bringing the family to uh, what was now the Wisconsin Territory, they of course lived through all the hardships and changing conditions of frontier settlers, uh, building a log cabin just like everybody else. And eventually their, uh, couple, this couple had six children. So the community grew uh, quickly, uh, kind of some chain migration as well as um, word of mouth. And eventually there was uh, more than a few Irish single immigrants and families uh, in this area. And the place uh, started to become known as Sligo after County Sligo in uh, Ireland. It's one of the uh, counties in Ireland. Um, it could be named after the county itself. There's also a town of Sligo. And there's also this feature, the uh, not Nare, um, a large limestone hill in County Sligo that perhaps, uh, you know, they were reminded of when they saw the bluffs here in Sauk County. At any rate, the Hickeys and Horkins were followed by uh, many other Irish settlers, including the Donahues, one descendant of the Donahues. Uh, Charles Donahue uh, tells a story of uh, another settler, Jerry Fadden, and his mother who settled under a big white oak tree that had been fallen down. They used slabs and sod and grass to make the oak into a home before it was near, because it was near a spring. So whatever means uh, necessary uh, to make a start in life, that's what they did. Donahue also tells the story that every Irishman who settled in the area reckoned his age from the big wind of Ireland. When they were asked their age, Donahue explained, they would reply, we were born after the big wind in Ireland but he chuckled, uh, nobody knew when the big wind blew. In the mid 1840s, um, the size and nature of Irish immigration changed drastically. The potato blight, which destroyed the staple of the Irish diet, of course, produced the great Irish famine. Uh, hundreds of thousands of peasants were driven from their cottages and forced to emigrate, or, and of course, many of them died uh, with uh, many of the emigrants coming to North America. Uh, conditions for many Irish immigrants uh, to U.S. cities in the 1840s and 50s were not much better than those they had left behind. They were often crammed into shanty towns, living in shacks cobbled together out of boards and other debris, and sanitation was haphazard at best. Jobs were also hard to find. Employers often advertised that the, their unwillingness to take on newcomers by hanging out signs that no Irish need apply. <clears throat> Irish women uh, did find uh, work often, though, as domestics, stereotyped as uh, biddies, which was short for Bridget, and Irish men uh, became servants or took unskilled jobs in construction. That was the case in, in bigger cities. I would hope to, uh, that uh, life here in Sauk County was a little bit better and a little more um, friendly to immigrants. I looked in the 
uh, early papers for the period and could find really no evidence of uh, you know, ads that said no Irish need apply or anything like that. Uh, certainly there was uh, discrimination though, um, being Catholic and, um, and Irish. One of, the, one of the immigrants that left during this 1840s period was a man named James Riley. He was born in uh, 1820 in County Mead. And he left Ireland when he was 23 and landed in New York City on July 3rd, 1843. And if you make note of that date, that's the day before Independence Day and New York was celebrating early. And um, as it was the first that Mr. Riley ever saw such a demonstration, he became quite excited over the hubbub of the day's doings. And when the sky rockets and fireworks were shut off, shot off in the evening, he was most alarmed and did not know what to think about it. Uh, at the commencement of the Mexican War, he enlisted in the New York 1st Regiment Volunteers under the command of Captain Wagley. And he was on. He was in for quite an adventure. His company went to Philadelphia by boat, where it boarded a sailing vessel bound for Monterey, California. They were over six months on the journey as the boat had to go around by the way of Cape Horn at the southern tip of South America. While well, crossing the equator, two masts were broken, and the boat was compelled to um, lay in at Rio de Janeiro for two weeks, uh, waiting for a man of war to come along and uh, bring them some new masts. And after arriving at Monterey, California, the first uh, real battle uh, commenced as a fight uh, took place. And he was in two other battles in Lower California where um, there was also a conflict. And uh, after that, the company was eventually sent to San Jose where they did patrol duty until the close of the Mexican-American War. Uh, when they were shipped back to Monterey, uh, they were discharged. So here was an Irishman who not uh, not too long in uh, the United States, uh, got involved in the uh, Mexican-American War, found himself on the other side of the continent. And uh, fortunately for him at this time, the gold fever had, uh, the gold rush had started in California. And Mr. Riley and a number of his comrades uh, went to the gold mines. Um, first, they procured three yoke of oxen and purchased six months provisions from the government. And the next thing to get was a wagon, which they did. A large tree was cut down and the vehicle was made uh, from that. The wheels were just round blocks with a straight piece of wood running through the center, something like uh, Fred Flintstone would have had. And when the axles became dry, one of the men had to grease them or they would catch fire. So they did what they could with what they had. And when they arrived at the mine, uh, the mines in California, the ox were killed and salted. But after two to three days, the meat began to smoil, spoil. So... Uh, they didn't want that to go to waste, so then the ox meat was dried. Uh, they, they, were for, they had to forego their corned beef, uh, but they did have dry beef uh, to live on. Uh, he did make a little bit of money in the gold mines, and um, after about one and a half years, he wanted to come back to uh, New York, and he literally walked across the country, um, and he said that the uh, mountains were no fun. He finally arrived in Pennsylvania, on Philadelphia, where he had his gold, which he had carefully brought with him, uh, turned into currency. From there, he went to New York, and he remained a short time before he came west and somehow heard about Sauk County and made a claim in Delona in May of 1850. Not too long after, he was united in marriage to Mary Timlin in the fall of 1851, and they went on to have 12 beautiful Irish children. That same year that uh, James Riley arrived in the area, the town of Delona was officially formed. Uh, the name Sligo was uh, kind of given up. I've never found that name on a map, but the area did become uh, Delona, which has this air of the Dells, the Wisconsin Dells era with a little Irish twist on the end. Um, so their presence there is forever recorded in the name of the town. By 1850, the early Irish immigrants and families that settled here were part of the enormous population boom that had happened in Sauk County. Uh, in 1840, there were only 120 uh, white settlers in the county, and just 10 years later, there were 4,371 people, an increase of over 4,000%. And in terms of percentage, of course, Sauk County would never see that kind of growth again. Um, now, not to be... Um, 
uh, thinking that the Irish were only up in the north part of the county. There were Irish settling in other parts of Sauk County as well. Uh, in Baraboo, there was enough Irish uh, settlers here in 1850 that the first mass was held um, in the Wisconsin House, which is the brick portion, the right side of this building, which was on the north side of the square, where the Al Ringling Theater sits today. And in 1850, uh, Father Gartner, who was an Austrian priest, itinerant priest serving uh, Catholic congregations across Sauk County, he held the first Catholic Mass in Baraboo here at the Wisconsin House. And Father Gartner was a remarkable uh, figure serving congregations all the way from Sauk Prairie up to Delona and beyond and over into western Sauk County and Bear Creek. Um, in Baraboo, the, the Catholic congregation, uh, after a few years, was able to buy uh, an old brick church that was uh, vacated by the Congregationalists and eventually went on to build other buildings, which we know today as St. Joseph's Church. Now we're going to go back to Archibald Barker, if you remember him from the beginning of our story. Uh, he also joined the Gold Rush. He went west uh, in 1850. Um, he did not cross paths with uh, James Riley. Uh, to get to California, California um, Archibald Barker thought about going cross country, but instead he took a boat, a ship down to Panama, uh, crossed the isthmus there on land and picked up another boat and went to the gold fields in California. He was there for a short time before he uh, got into trouble with a partner that uh, swindled him. And after resolving that, um, he went, uh, took a passage to Australia where his brother uh, was and was involved with the gold rush in Australia. So in late 1852, uh, Archibald Barker uh, made his way to Australia. Stayed there for a few years and then decided he wanted to go back to Ireland to see his parents one last time. So in doing that, he um, effectively had circumnavigated the globe uh, between 1830 and 1834 arrival in America and uh, traveling back to uh, Ireland in 1853. Also that year in 1853, uh, Irish were first settling in the town of Bear Creek in western uh, Sauk County. Eventually a community there would form and be called Loretto and it would eventually consist of St. Patrick's Church, a school, a tavern, and a cheese factory. Uh, one notable family there among many was James and Bridget Shanahan who settled there and a valley was named after them uh, eventually. The Shanahans were large uh, dairy farmers as many Irish uh, uh, eventually became and they had 40 to 50 cows in a farm that eventually encompassed 347 acres. Up in the Baraboo area, uh, the Terry family from Ireland uh, settled in Sauk County in the mid 1850s. Um, uh, there was more than a few of them, and uh, we all know, if you're from the area, you know Terrytown Road today, just north of, of town, and that was named, of course, after the Terry family. Now, Barker didn't stay long in Ireland after uh, visiting his parents. In 1854, he went to England and purchased a stock of dry goods that he was going to bring to the States. They largely, co uh, largely consisted of silks, silk fabrics that he was uh, bringing over, hoping to sell. And in 1854, his ship left Liverpool. Uh, it was called the City of Philadelphia, and it was uh, on her maiden voyage. It was one of the first steamships to carry passengers across the Atlantic, and it had well over 549 passengers and 88 crew on board. Um, and as glamorous as that all seems, and it was glamorous because this was a nine to 11 day trip, instead of the six-week trip that he had taken uh, uh, 20 years before, uh, a sister ship to the uh, ship that uh, Barker was on, the city of Glasgow, uh, left six weeks uh, earlier for America and was never heard from again. So these were still very perilous uh, journeys. 480 people on the city of Glasgow just disappeared from planet Earth. Um, and uh, to, to top things off, when the ship that Barker was on eventually uh, got to Newfoundland, it struck a rock off the coast uh, in September of 1854 and started to sink. Fortunately, the ship was not uh, completely uh, mortally wounded and was able to get close enough to shore where everybody could be put off 
uh, and rowed to shore. However, that uh, debacle ruined the trade goods or the dry goods that Barker had on board to the tune of $4,000 and he was not insured. So that ended his uh, dreams of becoming a dry goods merchant. Well, he got back to the Baraboo area, which of course he knew from his logging days, and uh, he checked on his land holdings here. He did have some land here, but he uh, was still a uh, wanderlust, and he went down to the Mississippi River area, somewhere in Iowa, and began uh, buying and selling farm produce, uh, mostly pork and grain. And it was there in Iowa that he finally met a wife, uh, Miss Sarah Jane Lamborn that uh, we see here many, many years later with Archibald Barker, but they married in uh, November of 1859 and uh, Archibald brought Sarah back to Sauk County to eventually settle down on the land that he had purchased here many years before. They went on to have eight children, seven boys and one girl. And mind you, Archibald was 44 when the first child was born and he was 58 when the last child was born. Sarah was, I think, 20 years younger than Archibald. Uh, back in Delona, while the, while the Barkers were having children, um, Irish life in Delona and nearby town of Winfield centered, of course, around the Catholic Church. As we mentioned earlier, Father Maximilian Gartner, uh, the Austrian itinerant priest, uh, would meet uh, once a month with uh, congregants in homes and barns in Delona. And finally, in 1857, Patrick Hickey, one of the first settlers in the area, donated land for the first Catholic church and cemetery. And this is the church, All Saints uh, Church, which was built in 1857-58, and you can see the cemetery there behind it. Uh, the church was built kind of at the base of the hill, and it said that the window frames were hand carved and the pews and benches were also hand hewn. Uh, it was heated, of course, with a wood burning stove. When it was finally afforded the first winter, there was no money for a stove and the parishioners uh, warmed themselves outside around a bonfire before going in for the service. Not sure how long uh, the service lasted, but I'm sure they got plenty cold. Um, the building uh, presumably had a balcony as well because there's a story of a crutch hanging under the stairs uh, as a testament to a miraculous healing that had happened at some point. The church is gone. It lasted about 100 years before it was torn down in 1958, uh, but the All Saints Cemetery is still there on Highway H, just uh, uh, west of the Dells, and it is a beautiful cemetery perched up on top of the hill that Patrick Hickey uh, donated. The Hickey Farm would be off to the right, and it has a beautiful view. Um, it is accessible, so you can go see it. And one of the interesting things about um, Irish cemeteries is that uh, the tombstones often indicate where the person was uh, born in not just Ireland, but the county that they came from. So more than a few tombstones, including this one, will tell you uh, what county uh, they were uh, from. So this, this person was from County Cork. By uh, 1860, uh, the surnames in Delona uh, for the census would include 32 Irish families, and in neighboring Winfield, uh, 30 families would register as Irish. By this point, um, they were from all of the counties that you see in lighter green on this map of Ireland. Um, so they really represented uh, the entire uh, Irish island, and uh, for sure there were there were people from the uh, some of the other counties. We just don't uh, have the documentation on that, but they were from all over the county. But apparently the tombstones indicated that they like to remind people of which county they were from, because I'm sure there were plenty of regional uh, differences. Uh, by 1860, when uh, Canfield uh, produced this map, Sauk County had grown to nearly 19,000 people. Uh, development would soon be hampered, however, with the onset of the Civil War. Uh, Sauk County eventually sent 1,646 men to serve in the Civil War. Uh, two of, 285 of them died in battle or from injuries and disease, and they served in all branches of the military and fought in all uh, theaters of conflict. And of course, this included uh, men from the towns of Delona and Winfield and, and either Irish men from Sauk County. Uh, men from uh, Delona and Winfield served in the Wisconsin 4th, 12th, 19th, and 23rd Infantry Regiments. And they also served in the 1st 
and 3rd Cavalry Regiments. And one of those riders in the 3rd Cavalry Regiment was James Riley that we met um, earlier. And he wasn't necessarily planning on uh, joining the Civil War, but the story goes that in the fall of 1862, while going to Baraboo with a load of hogs, he was met by a recruiting officer who was getting volunteers for the Civil War. He was so impressed that it uh, didn't take long for Mr. Riley to enlist, even though he was going to market. And he found himself in Company F of the 3rd Wisconsin Cavalry. And he uh, remained uh, in the company until the close of the war when he was discharged. Now, we don't know too much about uh, his service um, in the war. And by the way, he was 32, married, and with several children when he joined. Uh, not exactly the typical um, Civil War recruit. Uh, one that was a little more typical and also Irish was a man named William McCready. This is not a picture of him yet, but um, he was born in County Down in Ireland in 1836, and he came to America in 1850 with his parents, John and Elizabeth McCready. Uh, they were slightly different, however, because they were Irish Presbyterian, not Catholic, and they settled in the town of Troy in southern Sauk County. Um, not sure that they wouldn't have settled near the Irish Catholic, but uh, they settled uh, in Southern Sauk County. Uh, when the Civil War broke out, um, young William McCready was um, about 24 years old and he joined the Union Army as part of Company F of the 11th Infantry Regiment. And fortunately for us, uh, William S. McCready kept a diary for four years in the Civil War. It's over 100 pages of typewritten material today. And uh, so you can imagine the length of the original handwritten volumes. And I want to read a few excerpts from William McCready's uh, diary from the Civil War. October of 1861, McCready wrote the, the 8th Regiment commanded by R.C. Murphy is in camp. And we watched as revolutions went on drill with much interest and profit to ourselves. We are learning many of our duties about drill, parade, guard mounting, manual of arms, etc., from the men of the 8th. Their uniform is gray, and they have a live eagle which is carried on a perch beside their colors when they are on battalion and drill. They have named him Old Abe. We eat in companies in large mess house. We are all well fed, and we sleep in tents. On Sunday morning, October 13th, the Articles of War were read to the men, and when finished, many of the men said if they had known of these rules called the Articles of War being enforced for the government of the army, they would never have enlisted. Many of the young men thought that army life would be kind of a pleasure excursion for them. Many of them, including uh, William McCready, uh, were in for a rude awakening as the Civil War drug on. By May of 1863, McCready and his uh, regiment found themselves in the siege of Vicksburg. And on May 22, 1863, McCready wrote the following. While we were crossing the ravine, two small cannon in the fort on our right fired on us with grape shot, which killed and wounded some of our men. We then ascended a ridge for about 200 yards through timber, which had been cut to retard our advance until we came out in an open space in front of a foot on a hill. Here we received a fearful fire of small arms, chiefly from the rebel forts and rifle pits in our front, right flank and right rear. Festus Daly fell, Jacob A. Michael fell across Daly, and Captain J. A. Peasley fell across Michael. John Marquardt dropped his rifle and threw his arms around me with a death grip, saying that he was wounded and begged me to save him. I got him to release his hold of me and I laid him down in a deep rut that had been washed in the hillside by the rains. Jacob Langenneckard was shot in his bowels. He called me to pray for him and to tell his father how he died for the last, for this was the last of him. So the horrors of war were uh, prevalent in William McCready's uh, service to the country. Uh, McCready uh, served out uh, through the end of the war. Um, and one last recollection that I want to share with you is from May 19th, 1865, two years after the last passage I just read. And he said, thousands of Negroes who have left the plantations are now lining along the side of the fences and outhouses. They live chiefly on food furnished by the government. 
One old man was found dead by a fence when an officer approached his old wife cried out that her old man was dead, but bless the Lord, he died free. William uh, McCready, of course, returned to Sauk County at the end of the war. Um, he became a school teacher and um, again, left us this amazing journal. Uh, back in Bear Creek, we talked about that a little bit earlier where the Shanahans uh, resided and the little village called Loretto had formed. Uh, the Irish settlers there were ready for a church of their own. Again, they had been um, part of the circuit of pastor or father Maximilian Gardner, the Austrian priest. Um, but in uh, 1861, uh, land was donated by John Rice, uh, three acres for a church. And probably because of the war, uh, construction didn't get, a, didn't get around uh, happening until 1866 when a log church building was put up um, by March of 1866. Um, this was a poor congregation. There was no fixed amount for the salary at first, so he was paid at the mercy of the, parish, the parishioners uh, as their generosity allowed. New church buildings followed, and in the background you can see one of the later uh, Catholic churches at Loretto in the town of Bear Creek. Shortly, a few years after the uh, Civil War, um, the hops boom hit Sauk County and many Irish farmers took advantage of this great opportunity. Uh, this uh, hops had been grown in Sauk County for many years before the hops boom started in the mid 1860s. And uh, the boom started when the crop of hops in the Eastern United States was decimated by the hops louse um, an insect that uh, destroyed the crops, and that made hops uh, grown here in Sauk County quite profitable. Uh, in 1867, prices were at their highest, reaching 55 to 70 cents per pound, three to four times higher than they had been in 1861. And uh, two million pounds of hops were harvested in 1867, just in Sauk County. And if you do the math, that is over $1 million of 1867 money sifting through the local economy. Farmers with just as few as seven acres of hops in cultivation could net, net profits in the thousands of dollars, and some would, would pay off farm mortgages in one crop season. Uh, the boom, however, went to bust in 1867, or 1868, excuse me, when prices plummeted. Um, hops uh, continued to be grown throughout the county uh, through the early 1900s, however. But if you were smart enough, um, especially those uh, uh, farmers uh, in northern Sauk County where hops grew well, you could make quite a profit from the hops boom, and many of them did. Shortly after the hops boom, and certainly fueled by the success of it, uh, the Irish settlers in Winfield, which was just uh, west of Delona, decided they would like to have a church of their own. Uh, before that, they would have to travel to Delona to All Saints Church, which had been built there. And in 1868, St. Patrick's Church was uh, started in the town of Winfield. The church was served by priests from Linden Station. Um, and then after the first resident uh, pastor was installed at All Saints nearby Delona, he served both St. Patrick's and All Saints. Uh, four acres was uh, given for the church and a cemetery by Martin and Bridget Conway, and the frame church uh, shown here was built in 1872. And the cemetery is still there. The church uh, building is gone, and it's a lovely spot uh, in that part of Sauk County. By 1870, Sauk County had a population of over 23,800. The foreign-born uh, which, of course, were largely German, would include 6,552 of that total. But the next largest group behind the Germans were the Irish-born with 946. And, of course, those are the actual Irish-born, um, uh, not counting their kids that were born here. And with many of them having 6 to 12 kids, there were thousands of Irish-descended uh, um, people. Uh, so the Irish born alone made up 5.4% of the total population of Sauk County in 1870. Shortly after the census was taken the following year in 1871, uh, those Irish that were living uh, in the northern part of the county, again in Delona and Winfield, would have witnessed the great passenger pigeon flocking of 1871 when one point 
or 125 million passenger pigeons, probably the largest big flock used to nest in the region around the Dells, covering portions of Adams County and parts of Sauk, Columbia, and Juneau County. And those in Delona and Winfield and the Dells area could make great profit by killing passenger pigeons and taking them to Kilbourne or Wisconsin Dells today, where they were packed up in barrels and sent off to Chicago um, for people to eat squab. Um, some live pigeons were also captured and sent to Chicago Live so that uh, feathers could be had for uh, things like hats. In 1872, All Saints Church in Delona finally got a resident pastor. Um, up to that point, it had been served by pastors from uh, Linden Station or elsewhere, and a rectory was built out of brick, and that's the building we see here. Uh, it was built for um, the first resident pastor there, and it is the only building that survives uh, from that establishment. The church is gone, uh, so the rectory and the cemetery are what we know today from this uh, great Irish settlement in the town of Delona. This uh, congregation was so large and strong that uh, when Reedsburg Irish congregants wanted to start their own church in 1878, it was actually a mission church from Delona. And uh, in 1880, uh, the Reedsburg Catholics uh, finally constructed their first building, but it remained a mission church of Delona until 1885. And then the roles were finally reversed. The churches in uh, Delona, All Saints, and St. Patrick's and Winfield became mission churches of Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Reedsburg. In 1872, back in Baraboo, Father uh, Reverend Coughlin uh, was ill in 1872, and he realized he was dying, and he asked the congregation to start a cemetery. Uh, land was donated on Terrytown Road, and St. Michael's uh, Cemetery was formed, and uh, Reverend Coughlin was right. He died in November of 1872 and was the first person buried in that cemetery. The Catholics in Baraboo would eventually go on to uh, start St. Uh, Joe's uh, Cemetery up by Walnut Hill. Back in Reedsburg, uh, the Catholics were able to finally build um, much bigger and better uh, Catholic churches, and this is the old Sacred Heart Catholic Church, uh, which was replaced by the current building in Reedsburg. In the state census of 1885, the total Sauk County population numbered 30,359. At this point, the Irish-born population had slipped down to 752, so we see that Irish-born immigrant um, movement is stopping, uh, but of course there were ten thousands of Irish children born to these immigrants, so that was the next wave. Now I'd like to end uh, the evening getting back to where we started kind of with Archibald Barker. Uh, last we knew he had settled down um, west of Baraboo on uh, Terrytown Road. He became excess, a successful dairy farmer. And when he retired in 1888, he had so much um, money that he purchased this home in Baraboo. Uh, it was one of the finer buildings. It's a little dilapidated here. It's the only picture we have of it from later, but it was one of the finest homes in Baraboo. And this is where uh, Mr. Barker ended up after traveling around the world and finally settling down to become a successful dairy farmer. Uh, he died in 1890 at this residence uh, at the age of 73. Um, and I'd like to read how he was described in the paper, the Sauk County Democrat, when he died. And I think this is uh, probably indicative of more than a few uh, Irish people. Mr. Barker was a quiet, pleasant, prompt, active, honorable man full of enterprise. His words needed no prop or the scratch of a pen. We think he never held an office of any kind in his life except school district treasurer. He was both physically and morally courageous and fond of adventure. He had enough of native combativeness and courage to take care of himself, but was far from being quarrelsome and was always just. And I would like to wrap it up tonight um, with, with the funeral of Archibald Barker and uh, talk a little bit about something that was very typically Irish, uh, maybe not so much by the time Archibald died, but uh, up to that point, the Irish wake. And these were ways of paying respect to the deceased uh, and their family. Uh, from the moment of death until the burial, tradition was the 
was the body should never be left alone or unwatched. And this was to show respect and affection for the deceased. Now, if the deceased person was young, the wake was an event of uh, election and to pay respects to the family. However, if the person was elderly that had died, this was an event to meet friends, have a social celebration or party with stories, food, drink, games, and so on. At the moment of death, the clock was stopped, and this was done so all could see the time of death. Lighted candles were placed beside the body, and a dish of snuff was set by the deceased also. Everyone was to take a pinch of snuff and say a prayer for the repose of the dead. New clay pipes were filled with tobacco. Every man got a pipe, would lit, would light it, and take a few puffs. Women were given a pipe if they wished, and younger women were content to take a pinch or two of snuff. It was customary to give the clothes of the deceased to the poor, and Irish wakes were common across Sauk County for many years. And they were often held in the family home or if the crowd, crowd was larger in the barn. When the body was taken from the home to the church or the graveyard, the neighbor women stayed behind at the home. They opened the windows, shook out the bedclothes, cleaned, swept the floors, reset the clock again, and prepared a large meal to feed the family and friends when they returned. The casket was often carried on the shoulders of friends in a procession taking turns, often for several miles. Today, thousands of descendants of uh, the early Irish immigrants here in Sauk County live among us and across the country. Some of them have joined us from across the country and I thank you for that. And if you're not Irish, I um, hope uh, you enjoyed this as well. And thank you for coming to this presentation. If you have any um, questions, you can put them in the chat. I'm not sure if I'll be able to answer them or you can email us uh, as well through the website. But thank you everybody for coming and we will see you next time.